In this lecture, we are joined by our colleague, Professor Paul Francis. Thank you for being here, Paul. Uh, Paul's going to help us work through the difficulties of astronomical and space communities and the difficulties that they face when constructing sites on Indigenous lands. Uh, so thank you for joining us. My pleasure. So to begin, I thought I might ask, why do we need telescopes on a mountain? Well, for optical or infrared telescopes, the atmosphere is your enemy. Mm -hmm. If you're looking through the atmosphere, it's blurring your images, it's filtering out wavelengths. So you want as little atmosphere as you possibly can, mm -hmm. so which means you want to put them on the highest mountains you can, preferably mountains without too much bad weather, like the top of Mount Everest, mm -hmm. you'd be buried under snow and the storms and things that wouldn't oh. be a good sight. So what you really want is desert mountains. Mm -hmm. You also want a very smooth airflow. So Mauna Kea in Hawaii, it's just one 4,200 metre high mountain in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. There's a temperature inversion that locks the thermals below the summit and the air just flows smoothly over in a beautiful laminar airflow, giving you really sharp images. Mm -hmm. So when you're up there, it's the images are about twice as sharp as they would be from here in Canberra, for example. So you can just get sharper images, and especially if you want to work at infrared wavelengths, the lack of water vapour above you, because all the water vapour is below you, can be pouring with rain down at the surface in Hawaii, but up at the summit it can be incredibly dry, and that gives you the sharper images. Mm, so it's really a combination of height above as much atmosphere as we can possibly get, but then also having somewhat predictable or um, uninteresting weather going on. Yes, a very, very smooth airflow. Yeah. Um, and also you don't want too many street lights nearby, of course. of course. So that's why you want observatories on remote desert mm. mountains. Yeah. Of course, for radio astronomy, which is what you do, it's quite different. You don't need to be high for that. Yeah. So, so some radio astronomy, millimetre wave, you need to be high as well. So they use the high plains of Chile. But for radio astronomy, the problem is other people. Yeah, people. <laughs> So you don't, don't want anyone's mobile phones anywhere exactly. nearby. Exactly, technology. Um, no, no TV masts. Uh, I remember observing at one radio telescope and we got jammed twice a day when someone was driving their, their truck past. Wow. And every time they turned the ignition on, there was a burst of interference that jammed the entire signal. Oh, so yeah. for that, you basically want a very large, very flat, very empty place. Yep. It doesn't have to be mountains, but large, flat and empty, nowhere near people. Sure, no microwaves. <laughs> so... Okay, why we we have this uh, this issue and all these years of controversy happening um, in Hawaii around the use of the Mauna Kea mountain? Could we use another mountain for the same purpose? This is the obvious thing. Why are you building it on the sacred mountain? Why don't you put it on another mountain? Now in Hawaii, there basically only are three really tall mountains, and all three of them are sacred, so you've got no choice. And that's actually kind of the way it works in most places mm -hmm. that. Um, a place I'm most familiar with because I lived there for some years is Arizona and there was a controversy about the Mount Graham Observatory there because it was one of the four sacred mountains of the Apache people. Um, but pretty much every large mountain in Arizona was sacred to one or other of the tribal groups. And there's a good reason for that because, of course, originally the USA was 100% indigenous and Australia was 100% indigenous and large parts of the world were. And then the uh, Europeans arrived and displaced people and pushed them away. It's like kind of stole all the good land. Mm -hmm. So basically any land that was fertile for agriculture or had mineral resources was stolen by the invaders, my ancestors. Um, and so the indigenous people were pushed into the marginal lands, mm. the very dry lands. But of course, this very dry remote area is exactly what astronomers are after. Yeah. We want no, no, no people around. And so these are the lands where the indigenous people tend to be nowadays, yeah. simply because we don't want people around. And of course, as you've talked about many times in this course, for the indigenous people, the relationship to the land is a very profound one. And so anything that's going to be a huge mountain is going to be sacred. Yeah. Um, but it also applies to much more than mountains. I mean, many mm. trees would be sacred or rivers or creeks or um, rock outcrops. And so mm. trying to build anywhere in these things is going to be difficult. It's not as if that mountain is sacred, these three are not. They're all yeah. going to be important. Yeah. <laughs> OK, it's getting even more complex <laughs> when we have that in mind. So obviously this is a problem much larger than astronomy. You've already alluded to it there. Absolutely. I mean, uh, in fact, I think astronomy is a, a, a tiny part of a very large iceberg. Mm. Of course, indigenous people being dispossessed has been a story uh, 
300 years in Australia and 500 years in the Americas and more. Um, mm. But even today, uh, so indigenous people were pushed to the lands that the Europeans didn't want. But every now and then the, the Europeans discover they do want some of this land they've pushed the indigenous people to. It could be because there's a lovely high mountain they want to put a telescope on or a big empty flat plain they want to put a radio telescope on. But it could be, oh, we've just discovered that there's oil under this land or we want to build a lithium mine or a copper mine or something like that. And that's what sets up these conflicts. Mm. Um, and so it's and that's, that happens far more often with for mines than it does for astronomy. Yeah. But there are even worse cases like that, for example, um, in the 1940s and 50s, very often Western countries decided they wanted large, flat, empty bits of land to test atomic bombs on. And so in Australia, at uh, Maralinga and other places, they, they took important land and they set off atom bombs on it. That doesn't mm -hmm. get much worse desecration than that. Yeah. Uh, and that's happened in many other, the, the China, the Chinese in Xinjiang, the Russians in Kazakhstan, mm. they can pick indigenous lands and test their atomic weapons in them, the French in Mururoa. Mm. So it's a, a big problem, much bigger than astronomy. Yeah, and it's, um, for example, the nuclear bomb testing, it's a problem that goes on for generations. And I know, for example, Marilinga, they're still very much experiencing the consequences of the the testing and the displacement um, it's still to this day. So you did mention your time in Arizona during the 90s. Um, my understanding is that there was some conflict in that region during your time there. That's Could right. You so um, this is what I know a bit more about. I was a very junior postdoc, just finished my PhD, so I was not involved in the discussions, but I heard all the gossip around the sure. coffee in the mornings about it. Um, and this is interesting because it shows how these things it's very easy to think about you know, evil scientists trying to dispossess the, the native people, but usually when you dig into it, it's a bit more complicated than that. I'm not saying that's a wrong approach, but there are other approaches. So in the case of Arizona, at the time I was there in the, in the early 90s, they were trying to build on Mount Graham. There's going to be the Vatican Observatory and the Large Binocular Telescope. Um, now, Mount Graham is a, a long ridge, mm. about 10 kilometres long, covered in pine trees. And they wanted, uh, out of this 10 kilometres, to clear a, a couple of hectares. Yep. So it's far less than 1% of the mountain to put some telescopes on. Right. And they were being fought, as I was told in the, around the astronomy department, um, by two retired former medical practitioners from a nearby city, not indigenous okay. people, sure. who didn't want anybody to build on yeah. this land. Wow. And of course, whenever you try and build anything anywhere in the world, there's always going to be some people who object to it. And so these people, first of all, said, well, you can't build there because it's national forests. So it rung down from National Park in America. Okay. This has got to be pristine land. Mm. And the observatory said, well, actually, it's not that pristine because yeah. it's, uh, it's already got a road up there. There's a radio transmission masts and a, uh, several campgrounds and a reservoir and Bible camp and things like this. This is not a pristine right. wilderness. So given there's already hundreds of hectares of other development on the mountain, it's going to add two more hectares, going to make any difference. Right. Um, so then they said, well, it's sacred to the native people, which is the Apache in this mm. region. Um, now, the observatory had already negotiated with the local Apache group. It's actually not okay. part of the Apache treaty areas. Right. Um, but it was certainly, um, the treaty areas wasn't the full area they originally had grounds to. And they negotiated with it and come up with an agreement and okay. agreed that this particular area wasn't uh, clearing a few hectares on this huge 10,000 hectare mountain was not going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. But uh, there was different leadership in the tribal group. Okay. And they were in some sense stirred up by these non-Indigenous people and therefore changed their mind and decided it was important. Sure. Of course, you know, non-Indigenous governments change their mind all the time as well, so of that's course. nothing unreasonable about that. Uh, and that didn't work. They then decided that the, uh, the reason they couldn't build was because of the endangered red squirrel on the mountain. Okay. So if, if, if you don't, if you can't try uh, legal, yeah. uh, the indigenous issue, maybe try the heritage issue, maybe try the environmental, environmental issue. Yeah. If you want to stop something, these are the things you can do. In this case, back in the last ice age, a lot of Arizona was covered in forest. But after the ice age, they got hotter and drier mm. and the forests retreated to just the mountain ridges. Sure. And they're now separated. So yeah. a squirrel on this mountain ridge can't get to this one because they have to go through desert. 50 kilometers of desert to yeah. get from one to the other. 
And so red squirrels are not an endangered species. Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> but, <everywhere>. maybe, <laughs> but maybe the ones in this ridge now, because they've been isolated for 10,000 years, are now a bit different from the ones in that ridge. Right. And the question is, does this now oh, count wow. as a separate species? Yeah. And if it's a separate species, the Federal Endangered Species Act comes in and you can't do anything to do with it. Yeah. And so this is a big dude. Are these squirrels genetically different enough to be mm. counted as a different species? And so they had a huge fight about this. In the end, they end up with a squirrel monitoring campaign yeah. because the idea was clearing one out of 30,000 hectares is not going to make much difference to the squirrel population. Yeah. The trouble was it was a squirrel monitoring campaign worked out by lawyers. I talked to some of the biologists who involved it and they had to actually grab the squirrels and tag them, in oh which case goodness. some of the squirrels will die of a heart attack when you do oh. this. Um, but that was the only way the law lawyers were consistent. And actually turned out the squirrel numbers increased. And in fact, have been okay. flourishing ever since in this area. Okay. They're probably eating the food from the workers, lunch boxes, and things like this. Sure, interesting. But so you see that if someone's really determined to oppose it, then yeah. it's sacred to whichever local indigenous group is one of the weapons they can use as part of this. Yeah, okay. Of course, it doesn't mean it isn't sacred, it isn't important, yeah. but it's uh, certainly, it's a. Uh, um, you could stop everything. Mm. If, if, I mean, where I grew up in England, it wasn't so much indigenous heritage as historical. Sure. Any any road or railway or power line you want to build, you yeah. can always say, look, there was some battle 4,800 years ago, or sure. it was in the backdrop of the scenery painted by this painter, yeah, or sure. there's a burial ground from Br Bronze Age, or something like this. Shakespeare visited here once, or... <laughs> um, and that means you could probably never build anything. Yeah. Some people think that might not be a bad idea. And sure. um, maybe for astronomy, it doesn't really matter. I mean, if astronomy stops because no one can ever build any more observatories. Maybe we can go to space instead, but trying to launch rockets, you can also protest against any rocket launch pad. Yeah. Um, but it's also an issue for other things. For example, if we want to stop global warming, we're going to need to put in wind turbines and solar panels, which are going to need minerals to build these things. Absolutely. And if we can't put in any transmission line here in Australia, at the moment there's huge controversy about building new transmission lines mm. and all these arguments are being used against it. But if you can't build them, you're gonna to have to keep burning coal and that's yeah. gonna cause global warming, which might well do more damage to the land. Yeah. So in fact, Mount Graham, since the observatory has been built, has been um, burnt out three times by forest fires, bushfires, right. which has done far more damage than the observatory, partially, partially triggered by global warming. Yeah. So it's, it's a tricky one. Yeah, and you know, it really comes to the organisations, the governments, and really the people, because as we kind of learn in that story, uh, you know, people have a lot of power and, and can certainly push up against these types of um, projects. Um, but it's really up to all of these groups to do a bit of a cost benefit analysis when it comes to what activities we're doing here um, and if the price is, is ultimately worth it.